So class will be starting in a second. And uh, Marlene, are you staying? staying yes. Okay, great. So I'm just going to hand out packets. Okay, we have uh, several poems to do this evening uh, from the uh, 70s and the 80s. And they're basically a response to uh, wars um, and uh, representing the feelings that were going through um, Israeli society at the time. So the very first poem that we have on the page there is uh, from Naomi Shemer, Lu Yehi. And I wanna, hopefully this will work. Uh, I wanna play it from uh, Rachel Karazim's website. And no, uh, let's see. Just one second, I thought it would work from the, she has a PowerPoint. Um, and, uh, okay, so we're not gonna do it from there. I'm gonna find it this way. Uh, sorry, I thought it was, uh, let me just, uh, one second. And they only shimmer, and here it is. שיר שיר שכתבה נעמי שמר בימים האחרונים, שיר שתוכלו לעזור לי בשורה החוזרת שלו שהיא פשוט כל שנבקש לו יהי. This is Chava Alberstein singing it. So we met Chava Alberstein last time. כל שנבקש לו יהי. יש מפרס לבן באופק מול ענן שחור Hallelujah, 
So what, what does that song sound like to you? What does it remind you of uh, stylistically first? It's yes, that's exactly what it is. So um, Luya, he let it be um, is um, is so uh, for the song itself. Well, it, it, let, let me just share with you how Rachel Karazim, um, she's the one, like I said last time, this is her, her material that she's teaching us Hartman rabbis, and she has a whole website, rachelkarazim.com, with uh, plenty of material about poetry through, um, through Israel's history. So this is what she says about this. This song is probably the one most connected in Israeli collective memory with the Yom Kippur War. The Israeli National Library has a special page on its online site dedicated to this song. The title of the page is The Song That Became a Prayer. And indeed, this is what happened. It was composed in one of the earliest days of the fightings as the enormity of the challenges and danger facing the mere existence of the state became clear. The thousands of soldiers called up from synagogues during Yom Kippur services, the many who followed them in the coming days, were all thrown into the fierce battles along the Suez Canal and the Golan Heights. When Naomi Shemer composes this song for them and their families, she is thinking about this young generation who grew up with the music of the Beatles. For today's learners, this may need some explanation as the Beatles are not as well known as they have been in the late 60s and the early 70s. Their music was a soundtrack of a generation. In Israel, it was at the same time the music of the counterculture as the leadership from the prime minister to the minister of education were critical of this kind of cultural influence. Actually, the Beatles were not invited to perform in Israel. It was feared that they would corrupt the youth. So Naomi Shep, so you know, when they came to the Ed Sullivan show and, and performed at Shea Stadium in 1964, it was a long time before Israel, uh, I don't know if they ever played in Israel before they broke up. I don't know. I guess we could Google that. Naomi Shemer thus becomes the voice of public recognition of a generation that dared think differently. They may enjoy another kind of music, but they're still our own. Reading the song's lyrics, we sense the presence of an additional counterculture tone. This wartime song is not about victory or glory. It's not about important posts that need to be held at all costs. It's not even about the state and its borders that have to be protected. It's all about a prayer for the soldiers to come home safely. Just that. This simple message turned immediately into the prayer of the day. Uh, the Naomi Shemer song as well as, uh, no. So it came, um, let's read it in English. So we heard, we heard Chava Alberstein's rendition of it. Because Naomi Shemer does sing her own, own songs. And I have always found that she's, to me, she seems to sing off key. But she likes to sing her own songs. Uh, but it's a lot better if other people sing them. And uh, <laughs> like, um, uh, like Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, the most famous rendition of that is some other singer, Shuli Natan, singing it. And that's that, in fact, I'm five years old, and my parents have the album uh, with Shuli Natan on it. And that's what I... That's what that's what comes to mind when I hear Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. I hear the guitar playing first, but as it leads into the song, um, and then I, for this song, I don't know. Maybe it's Chava Alberstein's rendition of it that I think, but I've I've heard this song many many times. So I was eleven at the Yom Kippur War. I remember in Jewish Day School in Allentown, Pennsylvania, doing um, a project like we all had to. Uh, each of us in class had to kind of do a summary of that week's activities um, uh, of what happened in Israel during the Yom Kippur War. And, um, and then because my parents, we had just come back from Israel. We had attempted Aliyah in June 72. We came back in June 73, and the war is October 73. I remember walking into synagogue with my father. He was not a pulpit rabbi then. He was setting up junior congregation who was the education director in that synagogue. And as soon as we walk in the synagogue, people said, did you hear? Israel is under attack. So uh, that's, that's what I remember from the Yom Kippur War. And it wasn't until, of course, six weeks later 
something like that, that the war was over. And then it was, you know, touch and go as to whether Nixon is going to give give um, planes and weapons to Golda Meir to replenish the supplies. And then uh, Henry Kissinger had to be involved in that. And finally, Nixon allows this airlift of, of uh, arms to Israel. And because they were worried about World War III, because, you know, Russia was involved with with Egypt and Syria, so whole whole thing could have blown up. But um, the, the, that's the war that it's like Israel's Vietnam War, just in terms of amount of soldiers killed. So proportionately speaking, it's like the Vietnam War was to America, how many soldiers uh, were killed in the war. I, only a few thousand, but a few thousand compared to the Six Day War, when it was a couple hundred, so this was so uh, unbelievable um, turning point in Israel's history because after the Six Day War, you're thinking, wow, nobody can beat Israel. And then Syria and Egypt attack on the holiest day of the year purposely and nearly, nearly destroy the country. So this is what Naomi Shemer is responding to in this song. There is yet a white sail on the horizon set against the dark and heavy clouds. All that we ask for, let it be. And if in the windows by evening the festive candles should flicker, all that we ask for, let it be. What festive candles can you think of would, would be if this, war, if this poem was written during the Yom Kippur War itself? Sukkot, exactly right. Sukkot candles. Or, right, but festive candles. And, and in Hebrew, it's nerot hachag. So it's the holiday candles could be, it should be translated that way. And Luyahi is, is like a prayer itself. So Naomi Shemer, secular person growing up on a kibbutz, on a secular kibbutz in Israel, this is, this is how a secular person would, would pray. And there's, there's other kind of language here, Anna. Uh, Anna here, it's not, that's biblical. That's not modern Hebrew. It's, it's like saying uh, thy or thine or, you know, doing Shakespeare English. Anna is like Shakespeare Hebrew or a biblical Hebrew. Nobody speaks that way. And it's a language, language of prayer. What were you going to say, Marley? No, no, no. The, the, the Anna, it's not in um, the prayer book. Like, Pushy, Anna. No, it is. Uh, Anna, um, it's, um, it's what Moses prays to God on behalf of Miriam to get better. Anna. Rafana la, please, oh please, heal her. Um, uh, oh please, heal her, please. Um, so Anna, um, Anna Adonai Hoshia. So yes, it's in, it's in Halal. Anna, yes. So yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and it's with uh, Simchat Torah. Um, so yes, now secular people don't know that, but they know the Bible. Secular people know the Bible as literature, so they know that. And Lu Yehi, uh, I, I don't know, but this is this Naomi Shemer is this is her way of praying. And if the messenger should come late, come to the door, pl place good news on his lips. All that we ask for, let it be. If your soul asks to pass on from blooms and harvests, all that we ask for, let it be. The anguished voices I hear, the sound of the, sound of the shofar and the sound of the drums. So shofar of Yom Kippur, the war drums, all that we ask for, let it be. And if within all of them should be heard a single prayer from my lips, all that we ask for, let it be. In a small leafy neighborhood, a modest house with a red roof, all that we ask for, let it be. It's the end of summer, the end of the journey, let them return home. Right, because it's around Sukkot and it's end of the end of the summer, and rainy season is about to start. And if suddenly from the dark should shine the light of a star in our faces, all that we ask for, let it be. Give peace and also strength to all those we love. All that we ask for, let it be. So this, yes, go ahead. Peter, Paul, and Mary is an influence here too. Um. I don't know. It's because let it be, you know, um, the Beatles song, let it be is very similar yes. in, in sound um, and lyrics to this. Um, so it, no, it is, it is quite definitely um, um, a direct um, copy or, or um, 
you know, not plagiarism. I'm sure she got permission from the Beatles to do this. Uh, we'd have to look that up. I'm almost positive she did. So um, Peter, Paul, and Mary, um, you know, so it's interesting. Israeli folk songs versus American folk songs. You know, the, what, the, the different spirit behind these folk songs. So folk songs talk about the pioneering spirit. American folk songs talk about pioneering spirit. Um, I don't know, talk about peace, right? Um, justice, those kinds of songs. Hebrew folk songs are more about dancing. They're about building the kibbutzim. They're about back to nature, but they're like a biblical kind of thing. American folk songs aren't really biblical. They're about... This is a prayer. This is a secular prayer saying specifically... We want peace and stop the fighting and we hope the suffering will end. That's, that's what this song is about. And then there's this other song, which also was very, um, I, I remember hearing this song a lot called The, the Last War, Hamil Chama Ha'afrona, um, which uh, Yaharam Gaon sang this one. So I want to see if I can find this one on YouTube because I want us to hear this one too. Uh, the last four. Let's see if this comes up. Yes. Okay, here we go. Let's see if can, uh, there's no vowels, but let's see if we can find one. Also written during the Yom Kippur War itself. So it starts with the chorus. So I'll stop there. 
I, I guess uh, partly I wanted to play it because it's a blast for the past for me. And because um, my my parents have a lot of the Horam Gaon records. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they still have them. I don't even know if they have a record player anymore. But um, they used to play this all the time. And it was a way to um, to learn Hebrew. For me, my father would go over the Hebrew of the, of the song with me. And with uh, Yehoram Gaon's, uh, um, his unbelievable articulation and enunciation of each word, it's beautiful the way he, he sings. And um, I remember seeing him in concert. So like, uh, so I was in Israel in, um, for my rabbinical school year, 85, 86, and that was the year that uh, Natan Sharansky was released. So he's met at, uh, at Ben Gurion by Shimon Peres, or whoever is the prime minister of Israel at the time. And um, he's brought, I mean, imagine this guy has been in prison and now he's is facing the spotlight and he's brought to the Israel Convention Center in Jerusalem. What's called Binyanehu Uma. And there's like, we're told at Hebrew U, come to go to Binyanehu Uma and go see, get a seat and try to see Natan Sharansky on stage. And he's going to say, like, thanks and great to be here. And there was a concert too, like Yehoram Gaon sang. So this was like, wow, this was like unbelievable that. Um, you win. I went. Yes, I was there. I was there for Natan Sharansky being welcomed. And he like only knew a few words of Hebrew that he self-taught in prison in, in Russia. And uh, so he said a couple of things, he, like smattering of Russian English. Now he's like the head of the Jewish agency, right, since then. And um, anyway, just have your, your Horam go. Maybe I'm mixing, conflating a couple things that happened in Israel at the time, but I just have a sense that there was some kind of concert to welcome him uh, to Israel and, and that Yehoram Gaon sang at that. So um, anyway, this, this song. So remember, it's 1973 that this song is happening and that Israel's life uh, as a state is threatened. And Yeho so this is what Rachel Karazim says about this song. Um, uh, the singer Yehoram Gaon tells the story of many such performances following the battles of the Yom Kippur War when soldiers had asked him why were there not new songs written for this war. When later that week he had met the musician Duby Zeltzer and lyricist Chaim Heffer, he shared this with them and they sat down immediately to write The Last War. Yehoram Gaon sang it right away holding a page with the lyrics in his hand. By the time he had repeated the chorus for the second time, the soldiers were singing with him. The song became popular immediately and was sung with emotion, sometimes with te tears choking the singer's throat as they keep repeating the chorus in which the promise to make this the very last war is repeated. Uh, in the earlier years of the state, it was very normal to tell one's children that by the time they grow up, there will be no wars and no military service. As the generations go by, these promises, if at all expressed, sound empty and hollow. When comparing the last war to Lu Yahi, it's interesting to note the difference in tone. In Naomi Shemer's song, the voice is humble and expresses the basic of all wishes for the soldiers to come home safe. Although God isn't mentioned in the song, the prayer's words, Lu Yahi, um, all turn the song into a prayer. In the last war, the tone is very different. Every verse speaks in the name of a military corps, tanks, airmen, seamen. It's the fighters and the warriors who are making the promise and commitment to end all wars. The promises come from very virile voices to a very vulnerable little girl. So this may sound anachronistic as in the 70s, very few, if any, in Israel were sensitive to gender issues. We loved our brave, manly soldiers, and we expected them to protect us all, for sure, their little girls. So, in other words, she's she Rachel Korazim, being a woman, could be sensitive to the um, chauvinistic nature of this poem. When did women start serving? Uh, so, uh, so women are in the army, in Israel's army, but they're not on the front lines. I believe they're pilots, but some of that is, 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 is recent. Back in the 70s, women, uh, community service 
was compulsory, not army service. Um, so this was all men at the time in 73. So of course, uh, the fact that all men are, are writing and singing the song uh, for the time would not, but you know, talk about feminism. Uh, it's <laughs> Golda Meir was the prime minister. So it's still, the United States hasn't had a woman, pre a woman president yet. So let's read it in English. For all the tank corps soldiers with their dusty faces who survived all the enemy fire and grueling fighting, for all the sailors who attacked the ports, their eyes caked heavy, caked heavy with salt from the seas, I promise you, my little girl, that this will be the last war. For the pilots who broke through the deadly battle and were hit by rocket fire and anti-aircraft guns, for the paratroopers who amid lead and smoke saw you overhead like an angel, uh, I promise you, my little girl, that this will be the last war. For the artillerymen who in the hailstorm of mortars stood like a pillar of fire along the front line. For the medics and doctors who with all their soul and strength restored breath and life itself, returning blood. I promise you, my little girl, that this will be the last war. For the signalmen whose voice cut through the nights. For all the battalions and forces, for all the fathers who went into horrible battle wanting to return home to you. That was, um, again, uh, just hearing this and also going to Camp Roma, where there would be many nights around the bonfires that we'd be, that sounds so corny, but we'd be singing these Israeli songs. I mean, I don't know, but it's just... Um, it's just what we did at Camp Ramah, the, the, the Zionist spirit and trying to uh, rah-rah Israel kind of thing back in the 70s and the 80s. And nobody, nobody at, at all would consider arguing against Israel's existence and uh, questioning anything about uh, Israel's conduct in war, let alone at home. Um, and so... So today, I mean, just, just looking in the, at the news today and yesterday about what's going on in Gaza. So, so if you, I, I just urge you, it, you have to go on to Times of Israel with that website to hear, to read news in English about what's going on in Israel. Read what they say about what's happening at Gaza in contrast to the New York Times. And it's as if it's night and day what you're reading about. Because it's just, you just need to be aware. Just, just one example. I don't know if this was, this was um, publicized in the New York Times. But today, Israel sent in uh, truckloads, several truckloads of humanitarian supplies to Gaza. They sent it in. Uh, uh, basic uh, hospital supplies, uh, food, water, whatever. Truckloads were sent in and Hamas sent it back. Okay, so uh, just one example that what, what you see, uh, certainly Israel, <laughs> Israeli soldiers shooting civilians, and I put that in air quotes intentionally, looks bad. You can't counteract uh, optics with a boring lecture about context because people's eyes glaze over if Israel explains the context of what it's doing. So Hamas knows that and buys and, and then just, just puts its people into harm's way, could care less about the 2 million people that live there. It's all about, um, it's all about, the marketing and the propaganda. So, yes, yeah, so I, I'm taking advantage of this class on Israel through poetry, but there's some element to that in the, in the, po in the poetry of Israel as well, to whether it's pro-Israel or anti-Israel through Israel's poets itself. Just have to understand that back in the 70s and the 80s, there, there wasn't this sense in the American Jewish community from what I understood at the time, there's anybody who's arguing against Israel. That there, even then, when settlements were starting to be built after the Six Day War, there were still people in America who were against that. Oh, but they were like a minority voice. And I, I remember my father distinctly talking about some rabbis, some of these lone wolf rabbis who are um, in the um, Peace Now movement or something before that, that were anti-settlements, uh, but they were, they're ridiculous. Nobody's listening to them. 
but today there's more there's more of a voice um, for for anti settlement movement. I mean, it's been it's been nearly fifty years since the Six Day War. It's been fifty one years since the, so right. So it's it's bad. It's bad, and there should be an end to it. But okay. So I, I'm I'm saying all that the political commentary um, on purpose because of the, some of the poems that are, that are coming up. There's this other song here, the next one, A Song for Peace is famous uh, because this is what Yitzhak Rabin sang at a rally uh, after which he gets off the stage, is, uh, is escorted to his car and is shot in the back and dies. He's assassinated. After singing this song, he and Shimon Peres were on the stage, and Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister, Shimon Peres, the foreign minister, on the stage for uh, a rally for peace, you know, in the days after Oslo and uh, 1993, and the signing um, with Arafat and Clinton on uh, the White House lawn, right? So st still trying to maintain support in Israel for this. Um, and then he's, uh, he's assassinated after singing this song. So uh, this is what Rachel Karazim says about this. In recent years since the assassination, assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in 1995, people tend to associate Song for Peace with this tragic event. Yet the song was composed in 1969 as part of the program of the Nahal musical troupe. troupe. So uh, Nahal is one of these uh, many... Um, units in the army, and um, I forget what it stands for. I'm sorry, something about no, I can't. I can't. No, I no, our Halutsi, uh, something like youth pioneer, something. Um, anyway, uh, 1969. 1969 is is this time is what's called the War of Attrition. So it's after the Six Day War. Um, when uh, there's still these sniper attacks from Jordan and along the Suez Canal uh, of, uh, of the soldiers, of Israeli soldiers, uh, based along the, those front lines. So um, there would be guerrilla attacks uh, at night and um, from, from Jordan and from Egypt against the Israeli army. So that's what's called the, the war of attrition. So that's what this song of peace was from. The answer is in the, uh, oh no. As a matter of fact, Rabin, as many others in the military and political system were critical of some of the ideas expressed in the song. A question may therefore, therefore be asked about this Israeli paradox. Why is a clearly anti-militaristic song composed for a military entertainment troupe? Why would soldiers be expected to sing lyrics that speak against fighting wars? The answer is in the story behind the song's composition. Yaakov Rokblit, the lyric writer, uh, was severely wounded in the Six Day War. He often related to himself in the post war period as being shell shocked and finding little support for his feelings in Israel at the time. Right? Israel won. We didn't, nobody was killed, nobody was injured in the war. That's how great the war was. So people, soldiers coming back injured, you know, so kind of ignoring. Um, Israel ignoring its own. He traveled to USA where he encounters the anti-Vietnam War movement. He was influenced in particular by the musical Hair and writes his song in its spirit. By the time he comes back to Israel in 69, the echoes of Woodstock have reached here as well, and the young singers of the Nahal musical troupe love the new song and its message. Song for Peace soon turned into the song, song of all peace movements in Israel. With time, some of the harsh wording was replaced to accommodate a more mainstream message. In 1995, uh, and then, uh, right, so this is uh, just a description of uh, Rabin being, being shot. Um, so here, let the sun, Tanu la shemesh la alot, la boker le ha'ir, hazaka shabbat filot, otanu lo tazir, mi asher kavanero, Uve afar nitman bechimar lo yairu lo yachziru lekan ish ish otanu lo yashiv mi bortach tita fel kan lo yoilo lo simcha hanitzachon the lo shirei halel lachen rak shiru shila shalom 
Al tilcha shut fila mutata shiru shila shalom bitse akagdola. Let the sun rise and give the morning light. The purest prayer will not bring us back. He whose candle was blown out and was buried in the dust, a bitter cry won't wake him, won't bring him back. Nobody will return us from the dead, dark pit. Here, neither the victory cheer nor songs of praise will help. So sing only a song for peace. Do not whisper a prayer. Better sing a song for peace with a big shout. Let the sun penetrate through the flowers. Don't look backward. Leave those who departed. Lift your eyes with hope, not through the rifle sights. Sing a song for love and not for wars. Don't say the day will come. Bring the day. Because it's not a dream. And within all the city squares, cheer only peace. Right? So it is kind of funny that a, uh, an army troop would sing the song. But that's the whole message of the Israeli army, that it's the Israel defense forces. It's not, it doesn't take, they don't want to go to war and they preach um, the purity of arms and, um, and um, fighting as a last resort. Yes, Marie. The, the context from America is completely different, but I think yes. he's right about the whole Peter, Paul, and Peter Because that's what basically war protests on the still Compact, and that whole group. Right. They were writing, but it was a foreign war, and it was, they wanted this war to end, and it wasn't all about homeland. And it wasn't military protective, the military base was protective of everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different context that you're talking about. But the net result of the songs, they sound very much the same. A lot of the words right. are the same. Right. So it's very, I think it's very interesting. Yes, but you see, the anti-war movement in America is about going to what? Well, it's about Israel's own survival. So it's it's quite from that aspect. In from 48, 56, 67, 73, there's no such thing as an anti-war movement in Israel. No such thing, because all those wars were defensive. Even if you would say that Israel started the Six-Day War, it's because of the context of Israel's southern port being being cut off. Israel's supply line through from a lot. There's no way out for Israeli shipping. And is Egyptian troops in the Sinai. So there is no such thing as an anti-war movement through 1973. It's only we'll get to a couple of... Poems at the end that we get anti-war when Israel goes into Lebanon in 1982, and and subsequently to that, um, other fighting fighting against the Intifada. Though there are some soldiers today who refuse to go into the West Bank and had refused to go into Gaza. So, so that element of it uh, is totally different. The fact about the, the lasting effects of war on society, that could be the same. But I, I would just also point out the kind of war that America was involved in in Vietnam has a different kind of effect on American society than the wars of 48, 56, 67, and 73 do on Israeli society. But, yeah. uh, that's, I, you said it beautifully, but that's basically what I was saying, a completely different with yes. Right. So my point was the music. It sounds very much the same, and this uh, is where technology uh -huh. across borders. Right. Uh, right. Technology across borders. Yes. Can actually bring a similar sound for completely right. different. Right. Israeli artists knew that Israelis were listening to American music. But even though, but it's completely different. Right. 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 So the but the Israeli artists were translating them. Um, in an Israeli way. So, you know, taking rock and roll and making it Israeli. So, um, yeah, in a, in a very kind of naive, uh, it's just, it's just, so there's a movie that came out and I forget what it's called. Uh, it came out a couple of years ago about this, um, about this kid who like, this kid in Haifa in 1968, 69, and he like, it's the summertime and he's hanging out with his friends and he's like hired to be a spy from some Russian mafia guy who arranges marriages. 
it's just so, so weird. I forget the name of the movie. It was kind of a funny movie. I liked the movie for the music that played in, in the background because it was Israeli music that my, my parents played all the time. This is one song especially from this group called the High Windows. That's what their name was. Ha-Halonot ha uh, the High Windows. And Arik Einstein got his start in that group. And there's this one song playing in the background of the movie. So I'm at the movie with Lenore at Landmark Bethesda Row. They're showing this, I don't know, Israeli film festival, whatever it is. And I said, I remember that song. And then, oh, that song too. I remember that's so that's what I liked about the movie. I could, the, the, the plot itself was a ridiculous plot, but, uh, but I liked the music. So for me, the, the, this music, these two songs, Louis Yehi, um, or the three songs that we just did. I mean, they're kind of like the anthem of of my youth uh, from Camp Rama, from day school and whatnot. And it's this um, this from a time when when day school students in America were trained blindly to support Israel and to be Zionist, and depending on the camp, to that the ultimate is to make Aliyah. Um, so now, uh, so that we have time, the next song that we sing often here. Um, here, let, let's, do, let's look at it in English, and I'm sorry for the very small print on this page, but that's just the way it was. Uh, so it's called About All These by Naomi Shemer. Al Kol Ela, Al Hadva, Shvi Al Haoket, Al Hamar Vahamatok, so we know this. Honey and Sting, the bitter and the sweet, our baby girl, good Lord, please watch over them. The burning fire, the pure water, and the man coming home from afar. For all these, for all of these, watch over them, dear God. Bless the sting and bless the honey. Bless the bitter and the sweet. Do not uproot that which was planted. Do not forget hope. Turn me back so I can return to the good land. Keep this home, the garden, the wall, from sudden fear and sadness and of war. Guard the little that I have, light and toddlers, unripened fruit, and the harvested ones too. A tree whistles in the wind, the distant stars falling. My heart desires are now registered in the dark. Please watch over all these and over the ones I love, over silence and weeping, and over this song too. What do you think she's talking about in this song? Because when I tell you what she's going to talk about, what she is talking about, it'll surprise you. But what do you think this song's about? Honey and Sting, the bitter and the sweet, our baby girl, good Lord, please watch over them. The burning fire, the pure water, and the man coming home from afar. For all these, for all these, watch over them, dear God. Bless the sting and bless the honey. Bless the bitter and the sweet. What are we, what's the song about? Basic human, basic human stuff. That's safety, security, right? Family, right? Do not uproot that which was planted. Do not forget hope. Turn me back so I can return to the good land. What's that about? Do not uproot that which was planted. What was, what's getting uprooted? What's potentially getting uprooted? Ah, uh, so maybe it's settlements. Okay. What else could be uprooted in this? So this song was written in 1982, 83. Uh, what else was happening in 82, 83? What happened in 1979? Who came to visit in 1979? Peace, peace, Anwar Sadat comes to Israel, signs a peace agreement, right? Speaks to the Knesset. Unbelievable. I remember watching that on TV too when Sadat lands in Tel Aviv. Wow. Unbelievable. We thought, wow, now there's going to be peace. Absolutely. If Sadat comes to Israel, then there's got to be peace. How can there not be peace? So they sign a peace agreement, which means the Sinai is going back to Egypt. By 1982, 83, it's Israel withdraws in phases. Do we remember there's a town on the northern coast of Sinai? Anybody remember what that town is called? Yamit. Yamit. Yam is sea. So Yamit, the town on the sea, 
on um, – so if you, if you could picture in your mind's eye the Sinai Peninsula. So, you know, you follow the coast of Israel. So Haifa's up here, Tel Aviv, Ashkelon, Gaza, right here just before it curves and becomes straight. And then keep going. There's Yamit. So it's this like random town that's built out of uh, out of nothing, but it allows uh, for Israel's settlement in the Sinai uh, to be an outpost, whatever it is. So there's a so if you remember this um, is uh, American Jewish band called Safam. Uh, they sang a song about Yamit and a, uh, and how Israel. There's a big debate within Israel about giving up Yamit. This is what this song was written as pro Yamit. Don't give up Yamit. Do not uproot that which was planted. She's in favor of keeping Yamit. How could we give Yamit back? We got Israelis there. It's part of greater Israel. Naomi Shemer is a pro settlement, pro greater Israel kind of um, singer songwriter. And though she's secular, and most secular Israelis are today leftists, uh, there, are, there, there aren't that many leftists left in Israel today when it comes to uh, Palestinian issues. Everybody is kind of, um, uh, all hopes are dashed about peace with uh, the Palestinians. I encourage you to read Yossi Klein Halevi. That's a, he's, he's the, like the best. Uh, and he just came out with a new, a new book, a letter to my Palestinian letters to my Palestinian neighbors. So I haven't read the book, but I've heard him speak about it. I want to get the book. It's just uh, really all the dis- trying to explain Israeli position to the Palestinians, the Israeli narrative to the Palestinians, and and for Israelis to understand the Palestinian narrative and to, to understand that these are narratives that clash, and that uh, for if there was the right leadership on both sides, you could reconcile the narratives, or at least have as a, a, an atmosphere in which both narratives are cherished. And we say, okay, these were the narratives, now we are committed to uh, remembering the past, but moving forward together in creating a new narrative together. You don't have the leadership on either side on the Israeli or the Palestinian side that has any kind of support or willingness to, tr- to, to go into, to bravely go into these new waters to try to, uh, to try to make peace. So it's, there's a lot of despair. Anyway, 1982, 83 and, and giving up, I, I, I remember. So 82, 83, I was in Israel also for the year, but that was my junior year in college. And so before the, after the summer Ulpan and after the fall holidays, there was still a break before classes started. And during that break, one of the trips that Hebrew University offered to the students was a trip to the Sinai. But the Sinai had been given back. <laughs> so you had to bring your passport on a trip. So in order to go on the Sinai trip, which was a fun trip, it was great. We went to a lot, uh, traveling on an Israeli bus. Then you get... You go down the coast, uh, that part was still, I think part of that was still Israeli. I haven't been given over yet. Then you get to a certain point, you had to get off the bus, get all, take all the supplies off the bus, and transfer it to an Egyptian bus. Because the Israeli bus couldn't go into the Sinai. You had to get onto an Egyptian bus to take us. So we go down the coast. We didn't go all the way. Sharm al-Sheikh is at the very bottom of the Sinai, that, that point. Of the, of the triangle of the Sinai comes together. Further up the coast, there's uh, Nueva. And um, that had been a, uh, and Israel had renamed it a Hebrew name, Dizahav, I think. But in, so you see that, that this is Israeli resort. What had been an Israeli resort had been abandoned, and we're staying there because we're just kids. We're just camping out. The, where the bathrooms were and where the toilets were were just holes in the ground. <laughs> and that's where we were camping for Shabbat. That was Shabbat at, at Nueva. And um, then we also went to, the, to Mount Sinai. Now there's a, there's a monastery there, uh, Santa Catarina, 
St. Catherine's Monastery there, a uh, convent, uh, I think it's a monastery, they had built stairs uh, to go up the mountain, but there was also a path. So there's a, there's, uh, there's, there's, I wouldn't do this today. What we do as kids, or you never do again, but we camped out overnight and got up before dawn and walked up this path to the top of Mount Sinai. And uh, some of us davened at the top of the mountain, really beautiful, and then walked down the mountain on these steps that the monks had built into the side of the mountain. So that was, that was really amazing. And the point of bringing that up was about, <laughs> I don't remember now, but I think it was just about the transferring, about Yami. So we didn't go that way. We went this way about uh, just the idea about it going into the Sinai and that. So you're at Mount Sinai. There's nothing outside of the Torah later in Israeli history, in, in, in the Bible, any, anything related to the Sinai. There's nothing about the Sinai. Um, so the Sinai really is not part of greater Israel. Yet uh, people in Israel have seen the Sinai as important to Israel's security. So there are these um, Air Force bases that have been built in the Sinai as well that were very important for training pilots because you have all this room over the Sinai to fly, to practice, maneuver, and everything like that. And so um, like there were American assurances that they would help Israel rebuild these Air Force bases in the Negev, the ones that they were giving up in the Sinai now to Egypt. So there's a lot that had to, that had to be given up here, and there are many in Israel who were opposed opposed to doing that. That it was a but what what allowed it to pass mainly without a problem is because Menachem Begin of all people made peace with with Anwar Sadat. So the so the the most right winger, the most right wing of politicians in Israel at the time, Menachem Begin is the one who who makes peace with Egypt. So if he can do it, then it must be it must be okay. Right, the same guy who authorized the bombing of the nuclear reactor in Iraq, um, which was just what that was 1981, something like that. Right, so he he does that, but also makes peace with Egypt. So, which is, yes, which is, which is still lasting. It's still it's a cold peace, and Egypt somehow is involved in making this truce behind the scenes, working with Hamas to get them to quiet down in in Gaza now too. So, um, yeah. Did you read the book about like Rabbi Daniel Hartman? Yes. Or something. So this is like about this whole situation because they're right. very ambivalent. Because yes, it's like right. you know, like you're right over here and you're also right here, and it's such a complicated history that you know it's very people. Yeah. You know, no, it's it's really it's um it, there's no easy way to explain it, and it's so complex, and it's just so um so be so beyond repair that people are just people. There, anybody who's on the left in Israel is, is essentially laughed at because how can anybody say, well, we, we, need, we need to make peace. We need to fight for peace with the Palestinians. We need to give up. We need to give up territory. And nobody, nobody in their right mind is supporting that position in Israel anymore. And that's, uh, it's just, a, it's a travesty. Whereas American Jews are all for that left position. And that creates this gap between Israel and the American Jewish community. So we're kind of at loggerheads. I mean, for us, for me as a conservative rabbi, we're also at loggerheads when it comes to pluralism, because that's not a religious concept in Israel. It really, really isn't. There's no sense of any support of the conservative movement or the reform movement in Israel. There is a secular spiritual movement and awakening in Israel now, which um, still is that and that's an Israeli born kind of and led by Israelis. The conservative and reform movement in Israel are thought of as imports. Um, American Canadian import, and it's not seen as as an Israeli thing. So pluralism, egalitarianism, those are foreign concepts to Israel um, when it comes to in a religious perspective, not not from a political society perspective. You know, all four are fighting for equal rights in Israel, and women are, are have p 
political positions in Israel um, and leadership positions. It's not about that. It's about from a religious perspective. Uh, anyway, the, the couple poems I want to end with are from the, um, the war in Lebanon um, in which uh, they were trying to root out the PLO from Lebanon. But it's not, that's not an offensive. It's still a defensive war. Uh, it was so. When does it be a defensive war be considered not defensive anymore? In other words, if you're so the, from 1982 for for many years, there was this belt of territory north of Israel's border in Lebanon that was called a security zone, and many in Israel were saying we need to get out of there. Because we're there, it's it's more territory that we're seen as occupiers, and that what do we need it for to root out Hezbollah and the terrorists? It's not good. It's not looking good for, uh, for our position with with uh, with the West. And uh, yeah, so that the the defensive nature of the war to prevent the rocket attacks uh, then became offensive because it went all the way to Beirut. And then if you remember the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, right? So Arik Sharon, who was a defense minister, was um, brought to task for, uh, for turning a blind eye, allowing is the Israeli soldiers to turn a blind eye to let uh, Palestinians kill fellow Palest Palestinians in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. So Israeli soldiers didn't do killing, but they let, they knew the killing was happening in the camps and Israel didn't stop it. So that was a major, a major thing. So that's what these poems are about. So um, uh, yeah, it was Christian militias against Muslim militias. That's what it was. Because uh, um, in in Lebanon you have um, a lot of Christian Arabs and a lot of Muslim Arabs, and there had been a Christian Arab prime minister or president who was assassinated. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of infighting uh, in Lebanon today, and so that so much so that Hezbollah is in charge, and they they're the majority in in, in Lebanese parliament. What? Lebanon really doesn't exist. It, it exists, but it doesn't exist. And um, anyway, so that was uh, the, the civil war going on there. So, um, so, um, so the events of the Sabra and Shatila refugee camp uh, had a serious impact on Israeli society. They caused the largest demonstration ever in the history of the state of Israel. An investigation committee was called to look into the involvement of the IDF as well as the responsibility of the Minister of Defense, Ariel Sharon. Ehud Manor's song, Ainli Eretz Acheret, I Have No Other Land, composed at the time remains in collective memory as the popular call to take responsibility and speak up when one's homeland needs to be reprimanded. Um, so just a little bit of background that Rachel Karazin provides here. It's hard to decide when exactly the war, the Lebanon war started. I, uh, a good starting point may be the events called Black September. The 7071 armed conflict between King Hussein of Jordan and the PLO, based in Jordan at the time, under the command of Yasser Arafat. As a result, the PLO was expelled from Jordan and settled in southern Lebanon, close to the Israeli border. Okay, and then there's also Waltz with Bashir, an Israeli movie, famous Israeli movie that came out in 2008, that uh, was about this, this war, too. So there's this, um, uh, there's this poem, A Baby Can't Be Killed Twice. I want to look at that poem. And then also, uh, not the Get Out of Beirut one, but I Have No Other Homeland. The, so let's look at the one that starts, A uh, Baby Can't Be Killed Twice. On the sewage puddles of Sabra and Shatila, there you transferred masses of human beings worthy of respect from the world of the living to the world of the dead. Night after night, first they shot, then they hung, and finally slaughtered with knives. Terrified women rushed up from over the dust hills. There they slaughter us in Shatila. A narrow tail of the moon hung over the camps. Our soldiers illuminated the place with flares like daylight. 
Back to the camps, march, the soldier commanded. The screaming women of Sabra Shatila commanded the screaming women of Shabra and Shatila. He had orders to follow, and the children were already laid in the puddles of waste, their mouths open at rest. No one will harm them. A baby can't be killed twice. And the tail of the moon filled out until it turned into a loaf of whole gold. Our dear sweet soldiers asked nothing for themselves. How strong was their hunger to return home in peace? So you have these Israelis who had been taught that the Israeli army never does anything wrong and that they, they always had the support of the rest of the country because everybody was in the army. And here they were asked to do something immoral and unethical to allow the Christian militia to have its way uh, for a night in the sovereign Shatila camps. And that's just a, the first time that really Israel was, was forced to do something and Israeli, and Israeli soldiers had to think twice about orders. Israeli soldiers would never argue with an order. They would never do that. Here, here they were asked to do something that was unethical and uh, uh, putting them in this unfair, unfair position. And so it created a tremendous uproar within Israeli society. And then there's this last poem, uh, the very last page. I have no other homeland. I have no other homeland, though my earth is aflame. A word in Hebrew alone pierces through my veins to my soul with aching body, with hungry heart. Here is my home. So the, the Hebrew word is Beiti, my home. I will not stay silent that the face of my land has changed. I won't give up, but keep reminding her, singing in her ears until she opens her eyes. I have no other country, though my land is burning. Only a, he a word in Hebrew pierces my veins, my soul, with aching body, hungering in my heart. This is my home. I will not remain quiet, though the face of my land has changed. I won't stop reminding her, singing in her ears until she opens her eyes. I have no other country until she renews her days of old, until she opens her eyes. I have no other country, though my land is burning. Only a word in Hebrew pierces my veins, my soul, with aching body, hungering in my heart. This is my home. So it's really tremendous there that uh, just aching for understanding that this is the land of Israel, a land that is supposed to represent peace and justice and uh, higher moral, ethical, religious values, and then to be confronted with this uh, hor horrible uh, massacre in the Sabra Shatila refugee camps. So that really began to tear Israeli society apart. And then, and then, which we don't have, and uh, we don't, we don't have the, the time to get to are poems from, from the Oslo Accord and whether there should be peace with the Palestinians or not, how to make peace. And there's a lot of, um, and then the response to, the response to Rabin's assassination I mean, Bibi Netanyahu, in a way, could have some blame for creating an atmosphere that led to a Yigal Amir to assassinate the prime minister of Israel because he riled up the crowds and said that he can't, he can't give up land for peace. He just can't do that. Israel's security is at stake, and it would be uh, Israel's death knell. And so that ripped Israeli society apart. So there's a lot of things that, that are going on in Israel today that's ripping Israeli society apart. You have the tremendous influx of Russian immigrants after Natan Sharansky was released, the tre tremendous influx of, of all these Russians who are questionable as to whether they're even Jewish or not. And, uh, and so you have today's Israel's defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman, represents the Russians. So the Russian political party is him. Um, and is so strong in Israel that he's a defense minister. And then you have um, a Vigdor Lieberman. I believe he is. And then you have um, 
Then you have also the role of um, Mizrahi Jews in Israel, which was back from the, the 80s as well. So you have just their place in Israeli society today, what magnified with the Ethiopian Jewish community in Israel, that when they came, that also happened 85, 86, was a major influx, um, um, Operation Exodus or Operation Solomon, one of those. And so that is Ethiopian Jews were camped in front of the office of the chief rabbinate for weeks, if not months, because the chief rabbin had said these Ethiopian Jews had to formally convert to Judaism. When everybody knew they were Jewish, they were maintaining a 2000 year old tradition of being Jewish. It's just that they hadn't known about rabbinic Judaism. And just because they didn't know about rabbinic Judaism doesn't mean they weren't Jewish. They were still circumcising their, their boys at eight, at eight days old. They were still reading the Torah. There was their Shavuot started at a different time, uh, right? So when when you start counting the Omer, that's a fascinating question because the verse says from the uh, the morrow after the Sabbath. What does that mean? It's understood as the first day of Passover, but the word in the verse says the Sabbath. So when do you start counting from after the first day of Passover or after the first Sabbath during Passover? So that's how the Ethiopians do it. So their Shavuot is a few days later. It's like Eastern Orthodox, it's like Orthodox Christian Easter versus Catholic Easter. The different determination of the calendar when 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 Easter was. So it's the same with Shavuot. So just because of that, Chief Rabbinate, you're saying these are not Jews. So they finally relented and said that they're Jewish. They don't need to convert. But there's no Ethiopian Jewish yeshiva in Israel. They're too poor to set up their own system. So if they want to be religious, they end up being educated in the Ashkenazi or Sephardi yeshivas in Israel. And they're losing their heritage because they just, they're coming as poor, no money, no infrastructure, no, I have no idea what Western society is like to know that they even have the option to start their own school system in Israel and maintain their Ethiopian traditions. It's just oral traditions and the older generation is dying out and there's just no, there's no maintaining Ethiopian Jewish tradition within Israeli society today. So you have that problem. You have the problem of the Sudanese and Eritrean asylum seekers. You have uh, a huge gap between wealthy and poor in Israel today. And you have, um, um, there's no a full constitution in Israel. There's no separation. So Israel's, Israel's law system is a mishmash of leftover British law, and even before that, Turkish law, and new Israeli laws passed by the Knesset. So it's a whole mishmash. Israel needs a constitution. And when Ehud Barak was prime minister, he set up a commission to do that. But then, but then he was voted out of office and Netanyahu took over and there went that constitution committee. So there is no constitution for Israel that would address some of these differences. And, and then there's, all, there's a whole other point about Israeli Arab citizens of Israel. And the, so how can an Israeli Arab citizen sing Israel's national anthem? The Kol Od Balevav Panima Nefesh Yehudi. A Jewish soul is yearning. An Israeli Arab citizen of Israel is supposed to sing that? I mean, so it makes sense for Jews to sing this song. But if you're going to have Arabs as citizens of your country, it's kind of weird for them to sing Hatikva as their song because it's not their, their, they don't have a Jewish soul. And it's not their yearning for 2,000 years for a Jewish homeland. So there is a call to reword Hatikva. To, and there is, there is, if you Google um, alternative Hatikva words, you'll see it there. And it's like Neshama Karbach or somebody like that sings it. Uh, so you change a couple of words there to Nefesh Israeli. So an Israeli soul instead of a Jewish soul, whatnot. So anyway, there, there isn't even a call today to fix these problems because of the massive problem with Gaza and the, and the Palestinians. So that's the excuse 
that Netanyahu and Israeli government has had for the past several years. We don't have the time to put into all these domestic issues. We have this we have this major security issue with the with the Palestinians at our doorstep. So um, there are a lot of in Israel today who say, you know what, cut the excuses. We're the safest country in the Middle East, despite the fact that we had two intifadas. We're still the safest country in the Middle East, most democratic country in the Middle East. We need to maintain these democratic values. And that's what the poetry of Israel is, is trying to do, speak speak to these issues to be the moral and ethical voice for the for the people of Israel. So we got a, a little bit of a taste of it the past couple of weeks, and um, I hope we... Uh, we we uh, got the sense of what uh, what the poets of Israel are trying to trying to say. So have a have a good evening, Thank everybody. You. Thank you very much. Yeah.